Hi, my name is Zoya Stage, and my upcoming book is called Mothered. It is about a woman who is a hairstylist by day, a catfisher by night, and shortly after buying her first house, a pandemic starts and she loses her job. And her mother offers to come and move in with her and help share expenses. Only these two women have not lived together in almost 20 years. But Grace makes the decision to let her mom come in. And to make a long story short, that was probably the wrong decision. Mothered comes out March 1st. It will be available in all formats. Um, I will start just by saying I'm really excited to have to have the opportunity to talk to you again, Zoya, and um, to have Becky involved. Um, I, I like to clock what's going on with who's excited about what. And um, I, I know that Becky... We, we had an opportunity when we were doing a different podcast and uh, Zoya, you came up and we started talking about the different books and we had this little moment where uh, Wonderland came up and we just geeked out a little bit. And so like I, when, out I, over when, it. when that happened, I was like, if I, I, I kind of clocked that for later, like, oh, I could probably convince Becky to join join me if we were talking with Zoya. So that's. Uh, well, and I just my review for Mothered came out in on January 1st in Library Journal. So. I have that open as well if I need to refer to it. So Oh, awesome. Yeah, cool. Uh, but that's what inspired this uh, kind of group of conversation. Um, I, 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 I've I, never been nervous about doing like a one-on-one -on -one conversation, but I always feel like kind of the more the merrier. Um, so that's, that's why I, I like to get more, more voices involved. So that's, that's the reason for this format. But anyway, I've been talking too much. So yeah, thank well, you so also, much for you know, uh, I'm joining. I'm going to sort yeah. of stay, I, I want to stay out of it a lot too, because it's about her book, but yeah. Um, but like I have, if you want, like I was on the jury when she was nominated for first novel, I was on the jury uh, for baby teeth. Like I have like, you know, uh, and I think I've read every book. So that's yeah. awesome. So I can add in, but I'm going to let Zoya be. I mean, it's her, it's her podcast. But I think your <laughs> is interesting too, though. I mean, from my perspective as an author, like, I right. like to hear what other people think. Like, I don't think my thoughts are that interesting. <laughs> but, but readers do. But readers do think you're that interesting. And I feel like with your last book, I started to hear about you more from, from readers who don't, who didn't read you before. Um, and so I think that this is a really great chance to, more people want to hear from you now, I think, than they did even before. Okay. Like, Baby Teeth was all of us, but then, like, <laughs> you know, you've expanded out since then. <laughs> and we we actually touched on something that I was thinking about um, right before we got started with this, um, which was the idea of um, when an author has a book first released that they're not as comfortable talking about it because it's still fresh. And um, I talked to Stephen Hall, who is the author of The Raw Shark Text, which you can see right there, um, when his recent book, recent was like two years ago, um, Maxwell's Demon came out. And when we started talking to him about it, he's like, it's going to take me a while to get familiar with talking about this book because yeah. he's like, I had like over 10 years to talk about The Raw Shark Text and I got really familiar with it. But with this book, it just came out like a couple months ago and it's very fresh and I don't really know how to talk about it yet, which had never occurred to me. But um, uh, I have to imagine that you, you do have to kind of hone your thoughts on things. Yeah, that's a very real thing. Prior to Baby Teeth coming out, because of course, that was my first novel. What did I know about anything? But I did, I don't know, 30 Q&As, written Q&As for different blogs and sources like that. So I had some sense for what the talking points were and what kind of questions people would ask. But since then, I've not had experiences like that. So I've only had like maybe a couple of virtual events for each book. And so there's very much this sense of, um, I don't know if I know all the answers to questions people might have about my book. I don't know. We'll find out. <laughs> we will find out. <laughs> well, we'll do our, our best to like... Uh help you f flush out those those thoughts about about okay. the book and everything and i will say i've been on with rob on different podcasts he's a very good editor so he will actually make oh. you sound <laughs> awesome oh, so don't excellent. worry if you flub or you don't feel like it's great just say hey i don't like that answer let's try that again or when you, you do it. completely forget the word for like book yeah edit yeah that. No, i mean uh, it happens 
<laughs> well, so I was thinking about that too, because um, we, uh, on my previous podcast booked, we got to talk to you uh, for baby teeth. And then we also got to talk to you for Wonderland, but then the podcast kind of went away. So I read Getaway, obviously, but didn't have anybody to talk to about it. Um, and I recently read um, The Girl Who Outgrew the World. and which loved. Didn't, Which, oh my God. And I will gush about that um, forever. We're, I, I will bring it up later. Um, but didn't have anybody to talk to about it. So I'm glad that like I'm back into a podcasting thing so we can, um, we can talk about. I finished reading Mothered this morning. So it's very fresh in my head. The ending is very fresh in my head. And the I will say it is good. I hint I will at it say in my like, review. Yeah. Yeah. I got to that um epilogue and I, I read it and it's like a short epilogue, but like the very end of it, I was like, yes. Like I literally went, yes. <laughs> because I was so I was so satisfied with the way it ended. Um not a question, a question. but um yeah. 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 Are we gonna try and do spoiler free? Is that yes. kind of spoiler? I mean, free? I would prefer. Yeah, I think, I, I, I think that it was good to hear you talk about the book because it gave me a sense of how we want to talk about it as well. Like you gave a good setup um, that will help guide, I think, how I'll talk about it. But I go out of my way to be spoiler free because the experience of reading it is the fun part for readers. Right. Yeah. Right. So I'll, I'll, I'll tell you what, though, like uh, with in, in past interviews, I was very careful about not spoiling the book when talking to the author. And then in like the recent years we got this idea of we can do an extra conversation that is all about spoilers that only posts like separately um and i i don't know how valuable people found that but it felt like the authors liked to be able to talk about the stuff that they usually don't get to talk about so like but for the purposes of this yeah we're gonna avoid spoilers <laughs> well in that sense as an author like the most fun kind of author talk to do is a book club where everybody's read the everybody's book. Everybody's read it. Yep. Then you can yes. say anything, they can say anything, and that's very mm -hmm. freeing. Have speaking of book clubs then, have you had interactions so much with book clubs um or like things like that where they're enthusiastic, they've talked about the book and then they they reach out to you or do you have much interaction like that? The, oh, again, the only book that I really did any kind of book events for was Baby Teeth. And I did a couple of library book clubs, which was super fun. I mean, it was very fun. Um, and I did a couple of virtual events also with Baby Teeth and book club. And I think I did one book club online with Wonderland. But cool. it is very nice, like knowing that the people in the audience are there because they read the book and they're interested and I'm not going to ruin anything by saying anything <laughs> wrong. So it's always nice. So... With the pandemic as a topic, um, you talked about in the author's note, um, the idea of setting this book in the pandemic. And um, so we all have this universal trauma that we've gone through. And if you ask me, are still going through like for years and years. And um, I'm wondering if it was helpful or kind of like, a sore subject to be writing so much about that as we're continuing to go through a pandemic because it like we don't I, don't, I think we don't realize how like not easy it is um, to to experience and to experience it and have to like you know represent it in a book I was I'm I worry that like it was not easy for you I mean honestly the the whole integration of the pandemic into my novel was completely accidental I had not <laughs> intended to write a pandemic story at all. I had started to write Mothered at the end of April 2020. And my thinking at the time was, because keep in mind, there was a time when we kept being told, oh, another two weeks, we'll be back to normal. Another month, we'll be back to normal. And my thinking was that the pandemic was going to be a background element in the story. It was going to be something that the characters had recently dealt with. And that was initially, yeah. like when I was writing the first draft, that's how I was proceeding. And then the pandemic kept going on and on and on and on and on. And I started realizing, okay, there are things about reality that don't work in the context of this book if the book has this pandemic as past tense and I can't think that way. Like I couldn't think that <laughs> way because it was still going on. So I ended up, and I, 
And it was a good decision, but I had been a little bit reluctant, but I, I was like, okay, you know what? This just has to take place during a pandemic. And once I accepted that, it was absolutely the perfect reason of why Grace and her mother would be stuck together in the house beyond the point of no return. Because yeah. of course, in real life, if you had a situation that was just so incompatible, you would find a way to get the person out of your house. And that was obviously mm. for Grace, it was much, much harder because of the pandemic. So I'm like, great, I'm just going to use it. This is their story. So it was a bit of an accident. It, I, it wasn't something I set out to do. I will tell you as a reading experience, it I cannot imagine it not being with the pandemic because so many of the things worked so perfectly because you're absolutely right. At its heart, it's a mother-daughter conflict story. But every single time the pandemic changes, and I love how you incorporate it like, oh, we can go out a little bit now, just like we could. And then we have to get locked back in. And the isolation I felt was something that as a reader myself, but as I think most readers could relate to because they were feeling all that trauma. So even if our personal situation wasn't like that with our mothers or a family member, our life situations were. And it just, I was totally immersed into the story for that reason. I mean, and that's why as I was living through the pandemic, I couldn't not <laughs> write about it. It was so, it was everywhere in my life. It, it just was how life was. So at some point I actually went, and I had gotten that far in the story at that point, but I went back to the beginning and I'm like, okay, they're in a pandemic. It's not past tense. They're in it now. So that I could kind of incorporate, as you said, that sort yeah. of evolution of things that we were dealing with, you know, of, you know, I remember when, when people thought wearing a mask might be bad for you before it became everybody should wear a mask. I mean, there was so much conflicting information and conflicting reality. It was so bizarre. So in hindsight, now I'm glad that I've preserved it in a book because yeah. I think it is very, very easy as we kind of move on to not really want to think about it very much. <laughs> and it is easy to be like, okay, well, that happened. I don't need to think about every element of it anymore. But it, you know, in spite of what yeah. I say in my foreword, that I wasn't trying to document a specific pandemic. Obviously, I did document <laughs> a pandemic. Yeah. Well, I like how you said preserve it because now that I've read it and you know I thought about it, you're, that is exactly what you've done because there are points in it that I, I think will resonate with everyone. Like that time when you can meet with your friend, but it's outside, or that feeling like. You know, I, especially cause she's a hairdresser, like I can't work. How am I going to make money? Um, but then when there's a chance risking it to go to work, um, and then going back to this horrible situation at home, but you can't leave. I, there's so much you preserved of those feelings in a way. I think that's good because I think there are starting to be and have been books that sort of just use the pandemic as a dressing, mm -hmm. you know, a window dressing. And you really went all in on it in a good way. Well, thank you. I hope so. <laughs> yeah. Thinking about, so I have two examples of, that come readily to mind about how the pandemic has been depicted in like media recently, media like television, movies. So that um, Knives Out Glass Onion movie, have you guys seen it? I saw part and, of it and then I turned it off. <laughs> <laughs> well, in the very beginning, um, it takes place, it's set in the pandemic but basically Ethan Hawke just shows up with like a magic gun and like cures yeah. everybody. So they don't, so it's just put down for like the whole movie. Mm -hmm. And it's like this weird kind of cop out of not having to deal with, you know, the time that it's set in, but like, I think in a funny way, but then there was this um, slasher movie that came out called sick. I don't know if you've heard of that. Oh, I've been curious about that. Okay. Let's yeah. hear about that. It, um, uh, it takes place in the pandemic and a lot of the kind of revenge part of the slasher ap aspect of the movie um, has to do with the pandemic as well. And so it takes the kind of framework of a normal slasher and does works, works it into like if the pandemic was kind of the cause of, of everything that was going on. And um, 
well done. If you ask me, like I watched it and I, I enjoyed it. It wasn't like a mind blowing movie or anything, but the way that they, they did it, it was cool. And like, it was also funny to see like, um, you know, in this horror situation where like people are, you know, dying and stuff like people taking COVID tests. (laughs) So, um, I think that addressed it well, but like, it is something where if, if it's completely absent, you think this is conspicuously absent from this story. Um, so, uh, that's going to be something that people are going to have to grapple with. And I think that your book did it, did it very well. And, and I agree with both of you. It is going to kind of preserve that experience that we had, uh, in the story. So that's pretty cool. And the key as like a psychological horror story, it heightens that fear and because everyone can connect to it, both physically, you can like, I I would feel myself back in that time, but also mentally, that mental space we were in, in a way, I mean, we have a very, um, a, a narrator who maybe if not unreliable is not all with it because of the pandemic. And we all felt like we were sort of unreliable narrators of our life during that time. We were questioning everything that went through our lives and the choices. It felt like we were living in like an alternate world. And you just went right back to that. And as a psychological horror that you need that, you need that sort of suspension of reality and you have to have some sympathy with these characters who are not making the best choices always, (laughs) but we, none of us were. True. (laughs) Yeah. I hope, I mean, I hope readers connect to it and accept that part of it. Um, We had a much, much harder time selling the book than I ever thought we would. I thought this was like my return to form, you know, more like baby teeth than anything I'd written. I was expecting to have the world open up to me. Honestly, I don't mean to sound like a jerk, um, (laughs) but no, the book was pretty much summarily rejected with the words, nobody wants a pandemic story. And I have not been expecting that. And um, Well, I think people want a pandemic story. (laughs) We need to validate some of our own horrific feelings we have. And I'm glad you brought up baby teeth because I, I, in my review in Library Journal that was in the January 1st issue, I said in my verdict that it feels like a bookend to baby teeth. I really do. I feel like it's the other end of the spectrum, right? From the, 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 the relationship when you're young to the relationship when you're grown. And I loved that about it. Well, thank you. Yeah, I mean, I know I shouldn't do this, but I do read reviews, like reader reviews, <laughs> you know, during the weeks before a book comes out. Um, I stop at some point, obviously. But, you know, there are definitely readers who are like, nope, nope, this this is too, this is a pandemic story. I don't want to read that. It's too close to home. And I know that, and it's fine. I know some readers will have that reaction and I totally understand that. But, you know, I am slightly paranoid, like how, what is the proportion of readers who are going to reject the book based on that because of my experience with publishers rejecting the book based on that. So yeah, I'm not like most confident right now, honestly. I will say, I think when Rob talked about that movie, Sick, um, that really encapsulates the people who are going to like it. The people who are like, look, the pandemic was awful. We're always going to live with it in our life in some way. It's going to scar us. But here is an escape that uses it in a way that also validates how I felt during that time. And I think that's the difference. There's that humanity there, even with all the awful things that are happening, because lots of awful things happen, right? It's still a horror novel. Um, there's that validation to us and that humanity, which I think makes it rise above just um, a window dressing, like I said. Um, Becky made a good point earlier, too, that um, like while it takes place in the pandemic, it's not a pandemic story. It doesn't rely on if if the pandemic didn't exist, like this book would still be as solid as it is now. So um, if, you know, if people are worried about like, it just harps on or belabors the point, absolutely not. Like this story is strong and, you know, um, you could interpret, and this is my not being a writer and making a stupid example, like a snowstorm or something like that in the place that would like be the reason that they are kind of like stuck together for a period of time. And the story would be just as strong. So like, um, I think there's an honesty to the fact that you put it in a pandemic, but it doesn't, the story doesn't rely on it 
to be the story that that it is. So if that reassures anybody, point, um, I think that, yeah, there definitely is. Their story exists um, in a pandemic, but not of a pandemic, I guess. I don't know. Or whatever I would, you know. Yeah, well, that's how we felt about it, you know, when we were first taking the book out on sub. And so when people started coming back saying nobody wants a pandemic story, I mean, I was shocked because in my mind, the definition of a pandemic story was where that is driving the plot and somebody's right. trying to like solve the pandemic or do something that's very kind of oriented around trying to fix some aspect of it. And it's like, this isn't a pandemic story by that definition at all. Right. But, you know, I could not place it in a snowstorm because I already did a snow book. <laughs> That's, that's, that's fair. That is fair. Um, well, I will say, um, when I talk about when I do reviews, I try to give a book three words and pandemic did not show up in my three words. It's three phrases. And I said that if you want to talk about this book in just those phrases, it's claustrophobic. It has es escalating dread and almost unbearable tension, which yeah. I believe is how you sell this book. You know, when we're at the library and we're trying to hand sell books to readers and tell them what it's about. Those would be the things I, I mentioned, which I think your other books share a lot with too. Um, at least in libraries, you're sort of a known quantity. You Your books <laughs> fly off the shelves because people know they're going to get that. Um, and and it's, it's going to be a solid, they know it's going to be a good reading experience. They're not worried they're going to get tricked or something bad's going to happen. And then if you just sort of say, oh, it's also set during the pandemic, they'll be like, oh, interesting. But they're going to read it for that unbearable tension and escalating dread and claustrophobia that is in, I think, all of your stories. Yeah. yeah. I, so. I love libraries. And I love <laughs> library readers because they're smart. <laughs> well, actually, we were talking before we started. You were saying how you love going to book clubs because book clubs, um, people have all read the book because we're very consciously avoiding spoilers right here. But when you go to a book club to talk, book clubs can talk about everything because everybody's read the book. And if they show up without having read it, as someone who's led book clubs for 20 years, I always say, we're not going to avoid spoilers because you didn't finish it. If you come, right. we're going to do it. Now, you said you've had great experience going to book clubs, especially at libraries. Yes, I love doing that. Um, especially for, it was really Baby Teeth, because of course, Baby Teeth was my only book that was published pre-pandemic. So okay. it not only was a popular book, but it was a time in the world where you could still leave the house and do things and interact with people freely without thinking about it. So I had a couple of wonderful experiences at libraries, book clubs um, with baby teeth. And then I did do a couple virtual events, which was still fun. I mean, that's definitely still fun. Um, but yeah, no, it's, it is interesting to me, like that I am publishing a book that takes place in a pandemic now, because I do feel like in a certain way, we're all kind of still in this transition of yep. the life we had before the pandemic, the life we had during the pandemic, and now like trying to figure out what the new normal is. So there's a lot of things like even related to being a, an author right now that I don't really know what the new normal is yet. Like I know in the hardcore midst of the pandemic, everything was virtual now it's like, okay, maybe I can see people again. That would be really nice. But I will say in terms of book clubs, we found during the pandemic at libraries that mo that authors did like coming to book clubs, which I think libraries didn't know. We didn't know how authors felt about it. Sure. And it was hard to get authors in person. And libraries were not always the best with technology in their buildings, right? Because it's taxpayer funded, it's hard to upgrade. But now every library hosts virtual events and having authors come to talk about their books with a book club is so much easier. So I think it's important for the authors listening to know, probably like Zoya, you also like doing book clubs. Yeah. And if you just reach out to the libraries in your area and be like, hey, do you want to read my book? And I'll come and talk that even if you feel like you're too small an author, libraries want to have that connection. And especially because the virtual works. Um, so well with book clubs now, it's it's becoming really more popular. I mean, honestly, it's one of the best things that came out of the pandemic is yeah. the new world of doing stuff virtually. Because there's a lot of stuff now that I do virtually that I didn't do before. And so being able to do, I know one of the book clubs that I did was out of Rochester, New York. 
Like I can do a book club that's based anywhere virtually. And so I do love that that aspect that actually allows me to at least virtually meet people in states and places that I would never be going otherwise, which I love that part of it. Yeah. It kind of levels the playing field a little bit um, in a way and opens up to more people. I, um, a friend of mine, uh, is, he's an author named Craig Clevenger, um, works at a library in, by Santa Barbara in um, California. And um, when the pandemic was going on, he started, uh, he kind of used his connections in the world, like with, with authors he knew and stuff to do like a, a writing series where he had like, um, you know, he basically interviewed all these authors he knew, uh, you know, for his, his library. And um it was cool because like he already had access to a bunch of people, but like then I'd be talking to him and he'd say, Hey, I, I'd really love to talk to so-and-so, but I've never really met him. And then I'd make a connection with them and then they would be on and stuff. So um, I like, and this might just be me not perceiving as much about libraries as I, you know, should, but like, I like to see um, like in that situation, his library didn't have that before. And now they did. And I, I like to see that kind of um, evolution of, of available um, interaction and stuff uh, that maybe wasn't as prevalent in the past. Yeah. And with the libraries, um, like sometimes it's not just individual libraries. It's like library groups. So like library systems. One other thing I've seen since 2020 is before there was this we can't do an author event unless it's in person and we have the whole table of authors and that's too expensive to now I am moderating for libraries all over the country, panels of authors where libraries are contacting um, me and my partner Conrad Stump from the Horror Writers Association and asking us to help them get panels. And we just, yeah. you know, call up all the authors we know who are worked with us, who work with the Horror Writers Association and get them these superstar panels, right? We try to always have smaller authors as well. And it being offered by the library system that's then showing it off to the libraries and the library workers so that they can buy the books and have that interaction. I'm telling you before it was like, unless it's in person, we're not doing it. And now it happens all the time. I just wanna say my own personal plug for libraries for people who don't know. I worked at a library for six years before I moved back to Pittsburgh. So. Yay! You're one of us. <laughs> it's That's in the blood. awesome. I didn't know that. <laughs> um, yep. I would say, though, that libraries um, now are doing such awesome stuff that I'm like, oh, I had that idea, but I guess I don't have to do it now. So um, you're kind of stealing my thunder a little bit. But I was like, I'm doing this with Zoya. <laughs> but um, back, so back to Mothered, one of the things that. Um, I found to be very effective for me in the book was, um, and, and I think I stated it previously as like the horror of not being in control. Um, there are elements in this book where um, people after the fact realize that they did something that they, they didn't, they weren't consciously aware of. Um, and that, has just always been so creepy to me. There's some, I know that there's so many different ways to do horror and it's has a different impact for different people, but that one really works for me. Like the idea that like, like the bad thing happened because of me, but it was cause I was not in control. Um, so, uh, is that something that, um, I don't even know how to phrase a question, but like, um, for me, it was very effective. But like, uh, what made you uh, incorporate that type of a thing in this story? Well, there were there were two elements, and one which was like the initial driving force of this story was this idea of um, being haunted literally by your past and having your past like show up, not just in a nightmare, mm -hmm. but show up in a nightmare that feels so real that you can't tell if you're awake or not. So right. it was sort of both of those elements of being haunted by your past and then having these situations of of nightmares that feel so real. I mean, I've had nightmares that feel really, really real, but this is like a step beyond. Um, so, yeah. yeah. So I wanted to play with those 
two elements. And also, I mean, the entire backstory of the book is expressed via nightmares. And I'm go- I, f- I found a word. This is not a word I knew while I was writing the book. But apparently there's a thing called hypnagogic hallucinations which are these like super, super, super real kind of nightmares that you really believe you're having a whole experience and you think you're completely conscious. Um, In fact, one of my first beta readers was my dad and he read the book and he hated, he hated it. And I was like, (laughs) oh my God, what's the problem? And he hated it. And I didn't know this, but he had had hypnagogic hallucinations when he was a kid and he was so terrified and apparently my book just triggered him and oh, I, no. I mean if i had known that like i wouldn't have said hey do you want to read this crazy book uh, but i didn't know that so i i inadvertently tapped into something that apparently some people really deal with in their real life it wasn't just me fantasizing about like nightmares coming to life so. I'm going to say that's a success, not don't feel horrible. You did that to your dad. Because when I talk about yeah. horror in my textbook <laughs> about horror, I talk about how it actually makes you feel real feelings. So what I like to say to library workers, because they're often scared of that reaction, right, for themselves. And I say, no, but people who read horror want that. They want that reaction. So what I like to say is, you know, think about the magic here. An author like yourself, Zoya, took letters and put them together into words that built paragraphs, that built a story that are all made up, right? And they made somebody feel something so real that it's it's there, it's present. That's yep. that's a huge success. Yeah, no, I, yeah. I love that. Um, I think, you know, my books do get very strong reactions from people. And for the people who like to experience things like that, they love it. But, you know, for somebody like my dad, who was kind of triggered by it, and his response is, I hate it. But that's still a very strong reaction. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Well, and I can't, I mean, of the types of stories that I've seen or read or whatever it is, you know, the ones that, a lot of the ones that I'm like, well, I don't have to read that again, or I don't have to watch that again, or some of the best experiences I've had. But like, now I know if I do this again, this is what I'm going to go through. And so an example with baby teeth, I can't remember the name of like the little like toy thing. Um, oh, her little that, toy that she makes little yeah. dog. Yeah. So like when, when that not long after reading that book or throughout the years since reading that book, like if I see something on social media where a fan has made like their idea of what that is or something like I get, sad i have some of those emotions that came up from reading the book and like just thinking about the you know the ending of that book it, you know it it gets me to a place and so like um yeah i i'm gonna agree with becky like uh you do that very effectively well thank you i mean to me like the joy of horror is to be scared like yeah. that's the fun part if, if something, whether it's a film or a book, but you have moments of being genuinely afraid, like to me, that's almost like laugh out loud fun. You know, that's like, <laughs> that, that's the goal. So, yeah. But, you know, yeah. some people, if they go into it and they're just thinking of it more as that it's going to be a bit more of a conventional thriller or if they haven't read how psychological my books can be, I think sometimes my books can make people feel in kind of an icky way that they weren't planning on feeling. And it could be not enjoyable if they were unprepared. So that's, that's (laughs) That's fair. I, um, in a different life, like a decade ago through my podcast published an anthology and, um, we very strategically put this story at the very beginning. That's just real hard to like, stomach it's like it's just a real gut punch of a of a of a story and one of the things i love most is when people are like well i stopped reading after that story because you know that's it that's all and i'm like well that story did its job then like you know for the people who wanted to they'd be like well this is a promise let's see how they deliver on it and for the people who didn't they're like i i'm that's enough for me so <laughs> i once did a re- i once did a review of a haunted house book and i was like This is the greatest haunted house book I've ever read because while I was reading it, I had to put it down and go step outside of my house 
because I felt like if I didn't leave my, my house was going to destroy me. Like I had to, it's, I still remember that. It was awesome. <laughs> um, back to dreams though. Uh, I want to say congratulations on a very effective use of dreams because dreams is one of those tropey things in stories where it's like, or like just in life where the whole like thing is like, nobody wants to hear your dreams. But like you said, like it is, and I, as a reader think it was a very effective vessel for like dis- depicting what happened in the past, because like it's drudging up these like really negative, scary memories. And so like reliving it was an excellent way to do it. So um, thank you for having a wonderful, like this will be my example of like, you want to see how to do dreams? Well, read this book. <laughs> Thank you. I had a lot of fun writing the dream sequences because in part, I mean, in part they were backstory, but they always just went a little too far, <laughs> a little <laughs> past what the reality of the past would have been. Um, I love <laughs> writing crazy stuff like that. It was super fun. Um, like um, someone looking for shoes and all of them had like disembodied legs. In the, legs in the, in the, yeah. Yeah. I was like, where I actually stopped. I and I was like, how did she, how did she get this? Was this a dream she had? I mean, some of them were tidbits of dreams that I had. And I think that one, like, cause I, that one was something like, it was an image in my mind and I don't <laughs> remember exactly where the image came from. Sometimes like I have this weird thing where I will look at things and see them incorrectly. Like I'll okay. look at words and signs and see them incorrectly or just look at something and like what my mind thinks it is. And I have to look again and be like, okay, that wasn't what it was. So I think there was one time and I don't know where or when, when I had looked at a pair of shoes and felt like there were feet in them and, <laughs> and that became the inspiration for that. <laughs> wow. That's cool. <laughs> <laughs> No, that that was, they were, they were so well done that I was like, this has to be from prior experience. Like there's some times where you're like, this, this is something that wasn't created for the page. Like this existed beforehand. I will say, I hope they're not all from prior experience though, because it was pretty intense. Not all. Not all. <laughs> no, I know. I know. <laughs> One thing, and I don't know if this is going to go anywhere, but another topic that I was thinking that we could talk about is like drawing inspiration from or using situations similar to your own. Um, So like, for example, this is set in Pittsburgh where um, like, I I, I think you live in or near now. I do not trying to get like, okay. Not trying to get like rando creepy people to come find you or anything, but like, it's not um, a secret. People know I live in Pittsburgh. So. <laughs> Which I, I I went to. Uh, actually, Pittsburgh was my um, halfway stop between Chicago and Washington, D.C. to go to the inauguration of Barack Obama in 2009. So I spent a few days in Pittsburgh and it was really nice. Using my so, hometown and other bits of personal info. Yeah. Is that something that... Um, that so I, I have to imagine that some people do that. Um, like, so Grady Hendrix, for example, set my best friend's exorcism and Southern book Club's guide to slaying vampires and this new one, how to sell a haunted house where he grew up. And in his like author notes and stuff, he acknowledged that like for him, some of it was working through childhood memories and, and things like that. So was there any aspect of that? Or I know some people might just do it cause it's what they're familiar with. So uh, I don't know if there's an answer from you, but like uh, it's it's something that I'm curious about when I know that this is kind of close to home. Yeah, I mean, uh, when I wrote Baby Teeth, I was living in Rochester, New York, but it still took place in Pittsburgh. Mm-hmm. Pretty much every book <laughs> after that has at least had a character from Pittsburgh. Part of that is just complete laziness on my part because I don't really know how to research another city realistically enough to have us to have a character live there and be part of it and not have it seem weird. So it's just very easy for me to imagine places that I'm very familiar with where Grace in motherland, in motherland in mothered lives. Um, she lives <laughs> in a neighborhood called Greenfield, which I live right at the border of Greenfield. I mean, I could show you where her house is. Her house, okay, this is an interesting tidbit. Her (laughs) house, I don't know like the exact one on the street, but I had a general idea. 
and it's across the street from the first house I ever lived in. So oh, it's wow. right on Greenfield Avenue. That's super <laughs> That's cool. cool. Of course, like I imagined what it looks like on the inside in the backyard. I mean, I made all of that up, but the location is a real location. I like having, nice. in that sense, um, being able to draw on real places because that I don't have to like reinvent an entire universe for how that person functions in their neighborhood. It's like, I know how they function in their neighborhood. I know what they have access to because I live there too. So it makes it easier. I don't think you need to apologize though. Cause you were like, I, you know, lazy. I don't think it's laziness. I think there's something about an authentic setting. So you stand in good company with August Wilson because he used Pittsburgh for all of his stuff. And it is, a, I mean, I'm not from there, but I have been there many times. It is a great city in general, and it doesn't get enough starring roles in things. I mean, honestly, like August Wilson's the first thing people think of, I think, for Pittsburgh. And he's fantastic. You know, one of the best playwrights in ever of American playwright. But it's nice to feel authentic about a place. Um it's nice to notice things. Gus Marino's um, debut novel, when I was reading it, it's set, the first half is set in Pilsen, which is a neighborhood in Chicago. And he like, I go there all the time. I live very close to Pilsen. He like mentioned restaurants, you know, he mentioned the L stop. I'm like, I've been there. Like it was, <laughs> it was authentic. And you know, there's nothing, I, I think it adds, especially in horror to the atmosphere when we can feel that we're there. Readers can tell when it's not realistic. So I like incorporating the names of real restaurants and things like that in real yeah. streets. But then I do draw a line, which like for baby teeth with all of the schools that Hannah went to, I made up every single one of those schools. So there are certain things I need to have be completely fictitious, but that it takes place in a city that is recognizable to people who know this city, I think does make it seem like, okay, this is real. I mean, I want my characters mm -hmm. to seem real like these are real people i'm writing about do you uh is it just does that apply just to settings or do you like incorporate other things like um what's the best friend's name miguel like is there a miguel out there somewhere <laughs> there's not a miguel although i did have to give my hairstylist a heads up like i seriously <laughs> had to warn him because i'm like if you read this book and i gave him a signed copy of it like it's about hairstylists and her best friend is this gay guy with a cat. And I'm like, it's not about you <laughs> because, you know, it is very easy. I think for, for people who aren't writers to think that everybody just bases everything on people, you know, and yourself. And they don't necessarily understand that what happens with the creative process is I might take little bits, little bits of myself, little bits of the world that I live in, but when I put it together, it's a completely fictitious situation. So yeah. I did warn my hairstylist about <laughs> that. But I, I mean, I do draw on all sorts of little elements of my life and I don't do it consciously. Undoubtedly, they're just things that I'm thinking about or experiencing or seeing during the time that I'm writing a book. Sometimes it'll be other books that I'm reading that I'll like make references to or just little things in real life that end up being peppered into my story. Um, mm -hmm. But again, I do really feel the need sometimes to let people know who recognize some of those elements that it's like, no, this is not based on me or on anybody else in any literal sense. It's very much a collage of things that come together. Yeah, that's good. Oh, I had a great follow-up question and it just totally fluttered out of my brain. Oh, here it is. Um, okay. Another thing that um, I've, I've heard both sides of from authors that I've talked to over the years, um, since, you know, you have uh, similar settings with different books, do you ever feel the urge or the need to um, cross over anything? Or is that not something that you're into? Like um, some authors like would link this story to that one somehow subtly. So I'm not sure how you feel about that. Yeah, I have to say with my current book that I'm working on, I hardcore toyed with the idea of could this person go to McGill for a haircut or right. might this person know somebody from whatever. And I think I had toyed with it with Mother too, but um, it yeah. has just not had an organic way to work out like that. 
So in fact, so far, there have not been any cross references, but I'm not opposed to it. It's just, it needs to be right for the story and not something I just put in as a gimmick. Right. Yeah. I think that's a thing that fans often grasp to that they love because it's like, oh, they're acknowledging this other thing I love. Um, but I feel like the people that I've spoken to are, have a very kind of way they land on it. So, yeah. So stepping away from mothered, which everybody should get a uh, pre-order and, you know, get and read, um, the, the book that came out before this was the, um, I'll bring up my, the girl who outgrew the world. And this is like, so first I'm going to stop and I'm going to acknowledge, um, I don't know what made me the lucky person that I am, but like, um, when you get your copies of books from the publisher, somehow I'm always like lucky enough to be one of the people that you really? choose to send them to. So like endless I thank do. yous, like. Um, yeah, I got one too. Was, I gave it away to, after I read it, I gave it away to my library audience. Everybody was really excited about it. Like I got, so I always get these lovely personalized and above that you have, you like write cards. Uh, so either you do it for everybody and that's awesome. Or like I got extra special somehow, but, um, so I have to acknowledge I my appreciation. A handful for... of people get cards. I always <laughs> sign for sure, but a handful of people get cards. <laughs> Um, which is awesome. So I really appreciate that. And like, whenever you announce a new book, I'm like, I wonder if I get, I'll get, I'll get one again because I love it. Um, yes, so the girl who outgrew yeah, the that world book was great. is something that when I first received it, I was in between podcasts and I was really trying to like read, um, differently and stuff. But I also, so reading the, the description of it, I was like, I don't know. I, I, I had to kind of find a time when I was ready for it a little bit. Um, but I read that book and oh, it's got to be one of the best books I've read in a long time. I really, really loved it. And it just emotionally like steamrolled me. And I think it's fantastic. Um, but like the thing that I was thinking, so this won't make sense to people who haven't read it, but like um, there's not a care. Like I, I can't be in the shoes of our protagonist. I feel like I, like it, it felt foreign to be in the protagonist shoes. And if I had to put myself where I fit closest was like the dad. And, um, but I didn't think the way the dad did, but I just felt like as far as like my familiarity with like what the character was, were going through, like that's where my mindset was the most. Um, but I absolutely love the story and I thought it was fantastic. And um, the message of it was amazing. Do you, have you found that, it has like a narrower or a different audience maybe than other books of yours, or have you not really experienced that? I mean, it's, it's trickiest thing. It's, first of all, it's considered off brand for me. You know, it's a dark <laughs> feminist fairy tale, which is not what my novels are. Um, and that meant we could not find a traditional publisher for it. So it was published by a small press and, you know, let press puts out really beautiful books but it's a one man operation. So this was a book that did not have any marketing or any PR. So in terms yeah. of finding an audience, that's really the biggest challenge for it is it's a tiny book physically and literally. <laughs> and so not as many people are aware of it, um, but it okay. is still slowly finding, you know, there are still a lot of people who are finding me as an author. And I try to be really honest with people about the fact that this is an off brand book for me. Um, but it is a very, very special book to me, and it's why I wanted to publish it regardless of if it was traditionally published or published with a small press. I just wanted it to exist in the world. And the thing about books is they can continue to be discovered for a long time. So it doesn't yes. matter if people discovered it the month it came out. It exists in the world now, and now people can find it. So I have two things to say about the things Zoya said. One is, let the press is amazing. Um, I got the book because I work with Steve Behrman, who runs Latte Press frequently. Um, every year on my blog during Halloween, I actually uh, highlight a press, a small press for my library audience. And he was the, his press was the one I highlighted this year. I really think it's a press people should check out. He does amazing things. Um, and he does go out of his way to provide different points of view. Um, actually, I think I have three things to say about it. Number Number two about the book it is such a common theme, the story about 
the way the world, specifically the male dominated world treats women. And yeah. I talk about this all the time. Um, and I talked about it in my own book because women are writing more horror because they've been felt like they're allowed to. And they're, you know, there's definitely obviously trailblazers, but people like Zoya having success has led to more people being able to look at those darker things and not have publishers be like, that's too dark for a lady. I mean, it that happened, right? Books weren't published. This story uh, is an example of what is happening because of that. Women are exploring their bodies. They're exploring the way they're treated by the world in honest ways that there was no representation before. And so I feel like this story, yes, it is a dark fairy tale, um, whereas your other stories are more psychological based. It does, it, it's important. And it is one of those themed stories that I think will get more and more noticed because of your name and because it's a popular trend. And the third thing I wanna say is, I don't think it's that off brand for you. You know, yeah. as I said before we started, I've read all of your books. It's still about familial relationships, right? And and at the heart, I mean, that's very basic, but at the heart, all your stories deal with family somehow and not just parent-child, but family relationships in a way that I feel is more honest than a lot of ways stories do it. In fact, we were talking about Grady Hendrix before on his tour for um, How to Sell a Haunted House which came out this year, he talked about how hard it is to write families and how he stayed away from it because yeah. it is not a skill he thought he had. And this is his first book that dealt with families and all their messiness. But I feel like you've always dealt with that. Um, and, and in a way that obviously has brought readers to you. So that's what I want to say about that book and that what you said <laughs> about it. So. Oh, thank you. That's an interesting perspective. I mean, and I, I agree with you. I write about families and it will probably be what I always write about, but per the needs of commercial books in traditional publishing, their idea of what a person's brand is can be incredibly narrow. I mean, I already feel like a lot of people will think even Getaway and Wonderland aren't really my brand, you know, that I was stepping out <laughs> a little bit with both books. It's like, I want to explore different aspects of people's psychology in the relationships with people who are close to them in strange situations. I don't want the same strange situation over and over again. I want different situations because that's how I can explore different facets of it. So I don't know. Sometimes I do feel like traditional publishing, it does want to put you in a little box and I'm not really a person who wants to be put in a box. Um, but that is why I have the opportunity now to also publish with small presses, which is great. So right. I'm happy with that. Well, I'll tell you that um, it's not something as a non-author that I had ever occurred to me, but uh, I've had the benefit of like hearing people's experiences over the years now enough where uh, it kind of makes me mad how like eerie and fickle publishing can be about things. Like I, I know authors who were, you know, um, and like the, every bush book they wrote, um, you knew it was coming out and then like a trend changes. And then now their, their publisher's not giving them contracts anymore. And it's just because what people feel about a certain type of book changed, or even like, but it's scary because even talking to Paul Tremblay, um, before Head Full of Ghosts Ghost came out, he had written a couple of detective books, which are great. And I've read them and I, I really enjoy them. Um, but because of the sales of those books, it was a real hard sell getting Head Full of Ghosts published. And now in retrospect, it's like, imagine that hadn't happened. Paul's career would, would have just basically evaporated. And he needed someone to go to bat for him. Long way, long story short, what I'm saying is like, it's kind of scary how, um, how much people being, having access to wonderful stories, like relies on the whims of, of an industry that is there for profit. Like it's, it's not a meritocracy. It's like, uh, no. what are, what are, what are people gonna, what's going to catch someone's eye? You know, what's the next 50 shades or whatever. And that 
annoys me. It makes me angry. Um, but it also makes me worry because I know so much talented authors that deserve to get the biggest audience possible. And seeing that, like even the thought that that could be a struggle is hard for me to like yeah. think about. I mean, I, I think Becky knows this, that last year I'd written a middle grade novel. It's like, have you seen any announcements about my middle grade novel? No, nope, because <laughs> it's dying on sub. Because even though it is a, it has horror elements, but at the heart of it, it's about friendship because, you know, I write about relationships right. and at the heart of it, it's about friendships and it is a very heartwarming story even though it does involve a very interesting haunting situation. Um, and knowing that it was a little bit off brand for me and what people's expectations are for my books, we submitted it under a pseudonym and one that was not a secret. It was Zoya stage writing as, and I think my agent has still encountered, you know, people just expecting it like a deeply dark psychological book. And it's like, but that's not what I'm going to write for nine, yeah. 10, 11 year olds. So I will tell you, and yes, and Zoya and I talked about this because the Horror Writers Association this year started the first ever Stoker for middle grade novel because there's so much great talent out there. And I know we're still, when we're recording this, we're still at the preliminary ballot stage. But here's a great example. D Delia um, Dawson, who is a adult writer, one of her books is on that preliminary ballot. Um, and I think that there is going to be, and Chuck Wendig writes, you know, middle grade. And obviously our biggest example is Daniel Krause, who's very well known for writing in every age group across the spectrum and winning awards in all of them. But it, I think people like that are paving the way to saying, hey, we can write horror for kids and it can be different than our adult horror. Um, but I will tell yeah. you, it's interesting because middle grade at its heart is about relationships and specifically friendship is at the heart of any middle grade novel, because a lot of it is, you know, the joke is that the parents have to be killed or out of the way, right? But the reason they're <laughs> they're not centered is because kids need to explore themselves. And with friends, that's the best way it can happen. Um, so I'm hoping by having things like the first ever Stoker for middle grade and just an elevation of middle grade in general, um, that you will get a chance for that book to come out because yeah, it'd be great. Too. I hope so too. I love the book. It's another book that I just, I have such a soft spot in my heart for it. Um, I want to write things that aren't just disturbing and mentally upsetting to people. I think the fact that it is heartwarming <laughs> and especially at this time in the world for kids, it's like they deal with horror all the time. Can't they deal with it in a setting where then they have an incredibly heartwarming experience at the end Unfortunately, my agent has not given up on it, but it's been a very slow, not terribly productive submission process so far, which is, he warned me that it could happen and he was right. Yeah. I will say someone who's read a lot of middle grade horror this year for the award cycle, um, most of them have heartwarming endings. I that's That's what the middle grade, you know, terrible things happen during that. And then there's hauntings and, and then there is a heartwarming ending because you can't have that bleak trauma. Everything is terrible ending like in, in an adult book that could work, but you can, you know, you can still have that happen. Uh, recently someone asked Daniel Krauss, what, what it, can you put this, you know, can you go this far? Can you have cannibalism in a children's uh, middle grade horror? He's like, you can put anything you want in it. Right. But ultimately, you do have to have that resolution, and it has to be positive for kids. Right. Yeah. We'll see what um, happens. I, I'm hoping that, you know, I get another envelope, and there it is, you know, <laughs> with a little, like, picture of a bird on it or whatever. So, yeah, kind of speaking about publishing in general, like, and, and this could be me being naive. I'm just going to preface everything by saying like I have a very specific like impression of publishing in the world as someone who's just a reader and I could be ill-informed but my impression so um Thomas and Mercer is who's who's put out Mother, and um I hadn't really seen them doing a lot in general I'd known of them as a publisher for a long time but like I didn't really have much of an impression of them it's like oh, that's another publisher Amazon's publishing stuff okay but like recently 
And this is my impression. It seems like the publishing, like the publisher in general, Thomas and Mercer, and I was trying to think of the way that I could say this before we came, we started doing this, matured maybe in a way. Like the, it, it has evolved to to be cooler or better or I don't know. Um, and so I'm seeing names that are exciting to see um, like Cynthia Palaio, 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 Palaio. Is, is somewhat – and, um, Let me I, tell I you, I, I read that on. book when before it was done being edited. Before it went, it's really good. The one that she's putting out with them. Yeah, yeah. and then like I know that I, I haven't really ever read much Dean Koontz, but that's a big name, and like they're publishing the new Dean Koontz book. Um, and so my impression went from oh Thomas and Mercer, Amazon just wants to be in this game to like oh it looks like they're actually like kind of maturing or evolving or something. So how how has your experience been with them? Well, that is a long, complicated answer um, <laughs> in part because they're different than the big five. There are things that they do differently and it's almost impossible to talk about those things without knowing <laughs> how traditional publishing does things behind the scenes. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it is interesting at this point. I've published with two big five publishers. I'm working with my second small press now, Bad, Bad Hand Books and now publishing with Thomas and Mercer. So I have this very broad range of publishing experiences um, and can see the differences and the pros and cons with each of them. And there certainly are pros and cons. There isn't a perfect system yet um, for, for publishing books. So far, so good. I mean, my experience with them has been positive, but I think probably everybody who publishes with Amazon you kind of hold your breath a little and say, mm -hmm. but are they going to make money? Because you know how they massively discount everything. Like right now, Mothered is free through Amazon First Reads, which is why there are so many reviews for me to read right now. And also like the <laughs> yeah. ultimate test is, well, what does this look like in the real world? You know, and I don't know the answer yet. So yeah, it, it's, it is interesting to be with, a company that is so different from traditional publishing. With small presses, you know exactly what to expect and how they're going to be different because they don't have large amounts of money. But Amazon is different. And so seeing right. how they operate is very different. Maybe someday we can do a piece just about the different kinds of publishers and how they work and what's different from each of them. And then I'll know by right. then, like, what was my ultimate experience <laughs> with Thomas and Mercer? So. I do think it's something that other authors would be interested in hearing about when you've had mm. a broader understanding about it, because you are unique in that you've seen so many different sides to it. Yeah. Right. And it wasn't, and, I know sometimes, sometimes I'm concerned that other people in publishing think that this is intentional on my part, that I keep going from publisher to publisher, but like any other author, I'm just trying to get published and continue to make a living. It's like, I've not chosen to leave publishers behind. That was not what happened. So oftentimes you have like one choice of who you're going to publish with and you want to see your book published. That's who you go with. So, yeah. you know, I hope someday that I have a permanent home for my books, but I don't know, considering the range of things that I like to explore, I may always need to have multiple publishers. I'm not sure. Um, so done with the fanboying about um the girl who outgrew the world which like if i had i like i always want everybody to read all of your books but like if i wanted anybody to get something out of you i would i would want them to read that book um but anyway stepping beyond that um i know that one of the things that the <laughs> one of the reasons that Becky's on this podcast is because of Wonderland. So I don't know if you have any um additional geek outs, Becky, that you want to do uh over over Wonderland. Well, I just loved Wonderland because <laughs> I read it after Baby Teeth. And I loved that it was so different. I know we've talked about how, you know, you don't want to do the same thing all the time, but at the center it's about relationships. Um I loved about it that it was it felt realistic to me as a, as a mother, right? This family goes off into the wilderness. Also as a city girl, I've grown up either in the suburbs of New York city, or I lived my adult life in the suburbs of Chicago. The wilderness terrifies me. Like I don't mind visiting it, 
but this idea of like living down a dirt road where nobody can communicate and there's nobody to come and talk, like help. So that was kind of neat. But this, the way that it looks at the relationship, right? This, this mother who's sort of been absent from their life pursuing her career. Um, and this, they are forced to deal with being together for a variety of reasons, but then also the nature, the nature gone yeah. wild part and all yeah. of the weirdness it was just all encompassing both the relationships and the horror. And, and I am also a um, very strict about uh, if an author doesn't nail the ending for me, I don't like them. And that was a great ending. <laughs> and it was just, so I just love that book. And I feel like it is the most of your like weird stories. It's the most overtly horror of all your stories. Um, it still has that psychological aspect, but there are like, I don't want to give it away. There are actual things, right? that are attacking them, that are not real. Um, I, I, yeah, I just love it. And I wish yeah. I give it to everybody. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Now that book, yeah. it's another book. Maybe I just love all of my books. Maybe I'm just completely biased <laughs> and they all mean something important to me, but. Well, that's good. Yeah, you know, I, I had real concerns, you know, that was the book after baby teeth and my publisher kicked me to the curb. They did not want Wonderland that Wonderland was almost my undoing, like professionally and personally. That's like a whole other issue. Um, so it always means a lot to me when people actually read the book and get it and appreciate it and don't think it's like so different. How could she possibly follow up baby teeth with this? It's like it's still family with young totally children. Totally family. Dealing yeah. with being kind yeah. of in their weird house situation. I always like to have people enclosed in their situation. I don't know. <laughs> So I so, actually like, gave it a star review in Booklist in the April 2020 issue, uh, which I wrote before the pandemic started that review. And so, and talk about books having a long tail. So I just went back to look what issue it was in. Um, I still, in, in Booklist magazine, we give read likes because it's for libraries. And then they put them on the side. They're in the print, but in the digital, they're on the side. And I'm constantly adding that book as a read-alike to other books. Uh, and so I know it has a very long tail at libraries because I've done that really explicitly because it was so different from Baby Teeth. I want to make sure people know that it's not, because I think that's the one most people know, especially in the library setting. Um, and so I just, it's it's got a long tail. So I'm well, keeping it going. You. Thank you for all your support for all of my books in the <laughs> library. I really appreciate it. Because we haven't mentioned it yet, I love Getaway as well. I don't want it to be like, um, like we, because it wasn't mentioned, it wasn't important. I also loved Getaway, and um, I thought that was a great book as well. But what Thank I want to know, um, what was announced is um, you have a children's book coming out that is tied to Baby Teeth, and so, um, and that's with Bad Hand, Bad Hand Books, I believe, right? Yes, Bad Hand Books. And did they I are get publishing my Under Slumber Bumble Beast? Yeah. Which is the children's awesome. book that's Hannah's favorite book in Baby Teeth. And I'm so excited about this book. We have, I know everybody says this, but we have the most amazing illustrator. The It is going to, I mean, this book is truly, it's going to be a collector's item because adults who like Baby Teeth are going to love it. The imagery is going to be yeah. amazing, but it is also still a kid's book. The kids can enjoy too. So I'm super excited about it. And if all goes according to plan, it should be available for holiday shopping 2023. I will so tell you, Doug uh, Morano, the publisher, was so excited about this. He <laughs> meant, messaged me last summer to be like, you can't tell anybody, but guess what we're working on? And he's just, so when we talk about publishing experiences as well, it's so neat to see the publisher so excited to yep. be to be putting a book out. And this yeah. book, it's been so interesting. We have um, Zoom meetings like every two weeks with the illustrator. He shows us what he's working on and we talk about things. So it's been such a fun collaborative project too. And I've just never had that with a book with it being involving this element that isn't about me creating it. It's you know, a different artistic yeah. element and the collaboration with that. It's so fun. I cannot wait for people to see this book. My, my experience was 
I had seen you on social media mention it somewhere, I believe. And then I'd forgotten about it. And then one day I was like, wait, didn't she announce? And then I went to like search for it, like on like, you know, Amazon or whatever. And, it, and it's not listed yet, obviously. And then I was like, did I dream that? And then I had to like go back and like play it back in my head of like, is this just something that I like my mind manifested because it wants it, but it's an actual thing. So I'm happy. About it. Okay. <laughs> I have to say, I love you said, did I dream that? Cause it goes back to mothered. Yep. Right. <laughs> I love yeah. that. <laughs> So, um, yeah, no, that's awesome. I'm very excited about that. Um, because yeah, baby teeth was we, so like Becky mentioned earlier and then we'll, we'll, I promise I keep saying we're going to wrap up soon. Becky mentioned earlier, this horror, the idea of a horror Renaissance. And I feel like for me that really started to become apparent in, um, baby teeth came out in like is 2018, right? Yes. 18. Right. Yeah. And so like, I really started to notice, um, more awesome horror books and like that has just continued to get bigger and bigger and and like since between 2018 and now like my awareness of of the authors who are doing amazing things in horror or that could be considered horror is entirely different so like the last four years have been fantastic um and i can't even remember why i said that but um your so baby teeth getting introduced to that was that that kind of pivot point for me of like being from, yeah, I, I like reading horror, but I also like reading all this other stuff to like, I can't keep up with all the awesome horror that I need to try and read. Um, me either. So, and I've, I've gathered <laughs> I all of these authors. I am paid yeah. <laughs> to read all the awesome horror. So that is how I get through it. <laughs> yeah. But now it's almost like I can't, I'm looking at on the wall. You can't see it. The wall in front of me, it's got all the months and it's got all the books that I'm aware of that are coming out that I want to. Oh. And it's like dozens of books. And I'm like, I can't, I can't do all this. But um, so like baby teeth hit at that point where it was like a real pivot point for me at least. And I'm assuming that this is kind of a common thing. So it's good. I mean, for me, it was the whole beginning of changing my entire life. So <laughs> <laughs> what did I know before then? I knew nothing. <laughs> <laughs> is there anything you can say about um the book that you're working on now i would love to so much it has been such a hard secret to keep but um i'm so <laughs> superstitious i'm just so superstitious okay. and no one has read this book my agent hasn't read it and i know from personal experience that just because i write a book does not mean it finds a publisher so i'm a little bit reluctant to say anything about it until if, when it has a publisher, believe me, I will be screaming it everywhere. But yeah, you need now, to give it to your dad because then we can find out what, what it does <laughs> to him. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> um, good. I I've had that experience where uh, talking to an author, and they they're like, "Yeah, this is the thing I'm working on now," and they kind of give me a plot, and I'm like, "That sounds great," and then it has not been published, and and I'm like. I really want that story. Like, yeah. who do I talk to to tell them? Like, there is an audience for this. But so I understand your your hesitancy. There's like, um, there's a time and a place for sure. Yeah. To talk about it. Yeah. No, I can't wait to tell people, but <laughs> I don't know. I just, I know I started this by saying like, oh, I'm not very confident. But I think right now I am in a phase in my life where I am just not super confident. So um, when the book I'm currently writing has a publisher, I will let everyone know the minute I can. <laughs> Well, you know, you've got some cheerleaders out there. Yeah, uh, as, definitely. As this episode is definitely uh, an example of. Thank you. Um, and I really appreciate it. You have no idea. Thank you both <laughs> so much. Really. <laughs> so, Becky, because one of the reasons I want to do this podcast is to, like, draw attention to books that I'm excited about that are coming out. Um, and you are the best librarian in the world. Um, I thought it'd be cool if people listening to this would hear from your perspective, what can readers or fans of authors do to interact with their library to make sure that their libraries are getting um, books from the authors that they, they really care about? Yeah. And I think that I want to talk to also, I want to talk to the people listening who are readers. I want to talk to, with this to the authors out there and to sure. the publishers. So like your podcast, which focuses on books that haven't come out yet, libraries function in a world at least three months before, at least, okay? I would say more like six. 
when you work at a library and you order books for the collection, you are ordering books pre-pub. We are getting them far in advance. And when I am reviewing them, because I exclusively review for library journal and book list, who are both targeted at library workers to are ordering the books. My target audience is telling them what they need to know to see if that book will fit their collection for the pre-pub. And they also use it then to um, hand sell the title to library patrons, right? So all of my reviews are only positive and they're written to the best reader. Um, and because the goal is to tell libraries whether or not, you know, this book is right for them, I'm gonna give you the best scenario. So what people need to understand is I try so hard to incorporate small presses into my, especially my library journal column, because I plan that far in advance. So make sure if you're with a smaller press or you're an author who's independently working with a smaller press, you encourage early arcs to be available. I mean, I have read, for example, Sina Palaio, who's with the same publisher now as Zoya. I've read both of her, both her book that is coming out this year and the one that is going with Thomas and Mercer in Word documents, right? Before yeah. her editor gave the okay, because they are with smaller presses and it's harder, right? To get access to them. Um, so you need to make sure you're reaching out to um, libraries about your book. So if you're a really small author, here's the best thing you can do. And then I'll tell if you're a reader, you can go into your local library with a copy of your book after it's out, because this is the one situation where you can do this. Most libraries these days have a local author section. So it used to be, okay. be like, don't go to the library and tell them to buy your book or bring your book. They're just going to throw it out. They're not anymore because local authors are something that people come to the library for. So you should go with copies, be willing to donate them. I hate doing that. I am someone that argues for paying for your work. I mean, I only write reviews for, for paid sources because I'm not giving away my, my skills as a writer for free, but you are gonna get on the shelf at the library. And studies show that library users buy books at a higher rate than non-library users. A local author collection, one, they love to have it. When you come in, offer to say, hey, I'm also willing to teach any, like, do you need kid writing workshops? Do you need um, programming of any kind? Whatever it is, and just say, thank you for having my book. But then here's the thing, right? Local author collections, think about your local library. There's so many books, right? You don't know where to go. If you are a local author that no one's heard of and you just put it under your last name, it's gonna die there. But if it's in the local author collection, that's something people go to. It's a smaller universe of books that patrons will go visit. There's a whole cadre of patrons who love the local author shelf. They love discovering an author. That being said, here's the trick. And I'm going to tell you about authors and readers. Libraries buy books by authors and prioritize who they're going to have based on circulation checkout. Okay. There is nothing stopping you from going in and checking out your book and returning it the next day and then telling your friend to check out the book. I'm not kidding. I tell this to authors all the time. We don't see who's checking them out. When you get that report for weeding, how many times did it check out in the last year? That is why we keep a book or not. And if you're on the local author shelf and you get checkouts, they're going to put your name down to look for more books by you. They're going to call you and ask you for more copies. They might buy a copy then. Because here's the other trick. All libraries have some kind of ratio holds to how many copies they buy. So at my library where I worked, it was three. When three people were waiting for a book, it triggered us to get another copy so that people don't have to wait. Most libraries are doing about somewhere between three and six. All right, now if you're a reader and you have an author you love or you're Zoya's cousin and you live in California, I don't know if that's true, but let's just go with that. <laughs> Anyone who lives in any community can go onto the website for their library and click find the button that says suggest a purchase. Suggest a purchase is on every library website. You can go and suggest a purchase. Here's the, here's the trick because I worked in collection development, buying the books. If somebody who is a card holder who lives in your community, because in our selective purchase, we actually said, what's your card number, right? If you are a card holder who lives in our community and uses the library and you suggest a book, unless it's racist, homophobic, like wrong, like if you request it, we're going to buy it because an actual user wants it. In fact, in that form, it usually says, would you like us to place a hold on it for you? We know we're guaranteeing a checkout. There are books we spend money on that nobody ever checks out, that get zero checkouts. 
our cost benefit ratio, we're using taxpayer money, right? We really care about that cost benefit ratio. So if you're an author's relative in another town, or if you're the author in a town, just say, you know, buy the book, or if you're embarrassed, have some, like your partner do it or something, right? Get a library card. If you have a library card, go on, suggest a purchase, get the library will nine times out of 10, buy that book. Then make sure you send people in to check it out again to show that people are interested in it. Um, <laughs> it is, it, those records matter. That's how we build our collections. We don't know if you've read the book. We don't know if you've liked it, but we know if you checked it out. So those are my tips for everybody to help their favorite authors, to help themselves and for publishers as well. Well, now I know that <clears throat> one of the things I'm going to add to my workflow of like, uh, you know, um, planning the books that I want to read is telling my library to get them because it doesn't take any effort more than like having a library card and going on their website. So bookmark select a purchase for your local public library. Yeah, I'm, I'm, that's, I'm working that into every author that I care about. I'm going to make sure that my library knows about them. Um, and actually one of my things I do is I, I like to take little walks. I'll, I'll walk down like the downtown area of my um, town and then, and then the library is right in the center of town. So I can walk down there, check out a book, walk back. And that'll be like, I'm getting exercise and helping an author. So that's awesome. Great. Yeah, I really appreciate. Great. Yeah. I never, I never thought about that, but I think that's, ex I'm glad that you included the authors too, because like, you know, um, from my perspective, it's always been, what can a reader do? But it's nice to know that you can, you're giving tips to authors and how they can, you know, help themselves a little bit. And, you know, as a published author, I totally understand, you know, my books are textbooks for library workers. So I have a guaranteed off uh, audience. I have guaranteed sales. All three of my books have earned out their advance because I have an audience. A general author, the audience could be anyone, right? It's about discovery. And if the book isn't at the library, people aren't going to discover new authors. You might not take a chance on buying a book by a new person, but you will, right. if you're really interested in reading new voices, go to that local author section to see what's interesting or you know every library when they buy a book it does get time on the new shelf and that's a way to highlight it i might try something that looks interesting that i never would have thought of if it wasn't at the library so getting the books into libraries is important my reviews help that was you know if i review a book in those in those major sources they have a better chance of getting in it's why i take it very seriously to make sure i represent a plethora of publishers, large and small. But I can't do all of the books. Rob, you were talking about the amount of books that are coming out. I can't do it. I yeah. can't get every book <laughs> review. So this is a way you can help. And since horror is popular, especially since we're talking to Zoya, right? Those books are popular. Put more orders in. Because when people are busy waiting for Grady Hendrix and Zoya's book and Sylvia Marina Garcia and Stephen Graham Jones, they need other books to suggest to people. Yeah, absolutely. Um, bringing it back to Zoya. Um, and actually, I, so I'll do like this. I'll bring it back around. The reason we're talking, we're talking because Mothered is coming out absolutely in the next couple of weeks. And um, I loved it. I know, Becky, you really enjoyed it. And um, I think everybody needs to check it out. If Zoya is a brand new name to you, um, you've heard us gush about literally every book that she's written. So um, if you can't go wrong, if you go into a bookstore and you find one of her books, you're going to enjoy it. Or if you go to your library, grab what they have. Um, that's my advice. Uh, I'm so happy that baby teeth was one of the books that um, I chose to review back in 2018 because um, you have absolutely become one of those authors that if I know something's there, it's, it's a no brainer. I'm buying it. I'm pre-ordering it. Actually, I don't know if you noticed, cause like I mentioned before you sent me this and it was very nice and everything, but guess what? I also pre-ordered it so that <laughs> you got a sale out of me. Cause I think that's Thank important you. too. I get all these books for free, but like I need to support authors as well. Doing this podcast is great, but you know, I want to do what I can. So I'm gushing a lot, but, um, uh, I really respect your, your work and I'm always surprised and, and delighted by it. Um, so thank you so much for, for giving us the opportunity to experience these books. Well, thank you so much, Rob. I mean, really, the reason why I'm always sending you autographed copies of my ARCs is because <laughs> you're so supportive of my work. Um, and I really, really appreciate that. So 
Thank you. And, you know, I think you were the first podcast I ever did. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Booked was the I first forgot podcast about that. I ever did. So you're also my favorite podcaster. So there you go. <laughs> uh, my heart. My heart is warm. Um, great. Any final thoughts, Zoya, um, before we call it a day? I know we took up way more time than probably any of us expected. I just want to thank you guys. It's been a great conversation and I'm so glad I could be here talking with both of you. And thank you so much for all of your kind words. (laughs) Really, I did really need that right in this moment in my life. (laughs) (laughs) Well, it's all very genuine and very sincere. So um, absolutely. Uh, Becky, any final words? No, just, you know, go out and support Zoya's book and lots of horror books out there. They're all really great and coming out everywhere, but specifically Mothered. Yeah, absolutely. That's the focus of this. Do that first and then whatever else comes. I will point out a final kind of for the anybody's I don't know if you can see what the shirt is. It says oh, it always can, yeah. carry a book. Always nice. carry a book. That's cute. And the reason the reason I'm pointing out is it's from a place called Pilsen Community Books in yeah, Chicago. That's a great store. Um and you mentioned Pilsen earlier, so um always carry a book. I thought this shirt was nice and cheeky and fun. So uh, but also a good message. So there you go. Um, all right. That's it. We don't have any kind of formal thing. I'm just going to say thank you and we're done. Great. <laughs> okay. Cool.